Won't you be seated, please? Members of the Senate, members of the House, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. When we consider what cancer does each year in the United States, we find that more people each year die of cancer in the United States than all the Americans who lost their lives in World War II. This shows us what is at stake. The Congress is totally committed to provide the funds that are necessary, whatever is necessary, for the conquest of cancer. All of the agencies of government, the National Institute of Health, HEW, etc., are totally committed. And cancer has touched the lives of all Americans, uh, including uh, my own families. Uh, 1.5 million people will be diagnosed in the next year. Half a million people will lose their lives. We all know the terrible toll on families and the promise of treatments that will allow a mother to be there for her children as they grow up, that will make it possible for a child to reach adulthood, that will allow countless people to survive a disease that's claimed far too many lives. Rheolysin is a proprietary isolate of the human rheovirus type 3 daring. The name rheovirus actually is an acronym for Respiratory Enteric Orphan, delineating the fact that the virus is often isolated from the respiratory and enteric tract. Orphan is a designate given to viruses that are not associated with uh, human ailment. I have to say, the first time I read the initial protocol four years ago, I, I was a little bit surprised that we we're going to administer living virus intravenously to patients. Hello, I am Dr. Carl Mettinger, Chief Medical Officer of Oncolytics Biotech. Since the early 1990s, Dr. Matt Coffey is one of the pioneers in the world in the field of oncolytic viruses. In 1999, Dr. Coffey became the scientific founder of Oncolytics Biotech Inc. in Calgary, Canada. Today, the team at Oncolytics is spearheading a global registration program of Reolysin, targeting more than 100 hospitals in North America, Europe, and potentially other parts of the world. Reovirus was discovered in 1959 from isolates of diarrhea taken from a, a small child. The virus was investigated for several years trying to associate it with symptomology or with human ailments to no avail. Rheovirus has near ubiquitous distribution and is the most common animal virus found on the planet. It's found in almost all surface waters and is primarily found in stagnant water and sewage. Rheovirus replicates in permissive cells. Uh, like all viruses, it has a very unique mechanism of its replication and in this particular instance, Rheovirus will only infect cells with an activated RAS pathway. If we consider normal tissue, rheovirus will infect normal epithelial cells, normal tissues, it will internalize, and PKR, an antiviral protein, will recognize its double-stranded RNA elements and block the translation at the cellular level. In cells that have overexpression of EGFR or mutation of EGFR, or indeed mutation in KRAS or EJRAS itself, this function of PKR is no longer working. The virus is able to go through its transcriptional steps. It goes on to translation, and the actual growth of the virus results in cell death within 24 to 48 hours. In the presence of a carbotaxane or of a carboplatinum combination, uh, patients are unable to develop robust neutralizing antibody response to the virus which allows a much longer window of opportunity for us to infect the tumor with the virus. Uh, these drug combinations also decrease interstitial pressure in the tumor, promoting extravasion from the neovasculature to actually provide broader distribution of the virus and more efficient delivery, which is the primary hurdle to effective delivery of a large macromolecule like a virus. We've actually been able to identify virus in patients' uh, tumor samples following IV <laughs> administration with electron microscopy, aminohistochemistry, as well as samples or tumor tissue to actually demonstrate live viral replication in the tumor mass itself without affecting normal tissue. Dr. Kevin Harrington is a senior lecturer, consultant, and team leader for targeted therapy 
at the Royal Marston Hospital, an institute of cancer research at the University of London in the UK. Having studied the effects of the virus in both the laboratory and the clinic, Dr. Harrington is one of the world's most experienced investigators of realizing. We started working with Real Licence at the Royal Marsden Hospital about five years ago and in that time we've treated more than 150 patients in a range of clinical trial protocols. In our phase one clinical trial of Real Licence in combination with carboplatin and paclitaxel, we saw significant responses in the patients enrolled in that study who had a primary diagnosis of head and neck cancer. That included patients who had previously been treated with either a platin or a platin and taxane in the past. Those responses were sufficiently compelling to lead us to design an expansion part of that phase one trial into phase two, and that again showed us evidence that these patients were responding well with significant partial remissions in one case where there was a complete response of disease. A number of other patients achieved stable disease having previously had rapidly progressing disease. Those data were seen as being a clear indication for us to take this combination therapy of realycin plus carboplatin and paclitaxel into a randomized phase three trial specifically in patients with platin refractory squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck. Dr. George Gill is a pediatric oncologist who for more than 30 years has been involved in the development of more than a dozen anti-cancer drugs in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Today, Dr. Gill is Senior Vice President of Clinical and Regulatory Affairs at Oncolytics Biotech and is responsible for the drug safety in the Realizing Clinical Program. It's a very interesting agent, partly because it's synergistic with a number of the chemotherapies. And in spite of the fact that it synergizes the efficacy, it really does not appear to synergize the toxicity, <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you, you have the additional benefit with, with very little cost in terms of toxicity. We've done extensive testing to look for viral shed from patients. We have not been able to demonstrate that very often. And when we do, it appears to be in very, very small quantities. In fact, most of the identification of shed requires PCR amplification in order to even identify the virus. We've not seen ever any evidence of spread from a patient to a family member, and we've never seen any evidence in any of the healthcare personnel who handle the virus in the mixing, whether it's in the pharmacy or in the infusion station. We've never seen any evidence among nurses who care for these patients of any suggestion that there has ever been viral transmission from a patient to another individual. And in fact, in the majority of institutions where Oncolytics has sponsored trials and where the National Cancer Institute has sponsored trials, these patients now are being treated in the standard outpatient infusion units and the precautions are essentially no different than the precautions that are used with most of the standard anti-cancer agents. We saw very little evidence that the virus was shed from the patient and indeed in the subsequent studies in combination with chemotherapy we have seen very reassuring data that the risk of shedding of the virus into the environment is negligible. The way we detect that shedding of the virus is by a test that measures the genetic material of the virus, the RNA, and not replication competent virus. We have never seen evidence that replication competent virus is shed from these patients. We were able to take that data to our genetic safety committee and they were agreeable to our treating patients in the general outpatient area. It's now routine for us to treat patients as outpatients in a day unit setting mixed in with patients receiving other cytotoxic chemotherapy agents. We have been working with Reolysin for four years now, so we treated 
a lot of patients. I don't know exactly the number, but it's probably over 70. Um, and we haven't seen any problems with any family members or any of the treatment um, personnel uh, treating the patients. I'm Dr. Monica Mita. I'm a medical oncologist and clinical investigator at the Institute for Drug Development at CTRC. I'm also the clinical research director and interim and I've been an investigator for the real license studies for the last four years. I think it was an amazing experience and I have to say the first time I read the initial protocol four years ago I, I was a little bit surprised that we we're going to administer living virus intravenously to patients but um, then once we started treating patients, we had an amazing experience. Patients are doing well, they tolerate the treatment very well, they are able to keep their quality of life, they have very few side effects, and we have seen good results in different tumor types. In the sarcoma study, we administered the drug intravenously as a single agent, and in that study we have seen several patients with disease stabilization for a long time, including four patients who actually stayed on study for more than six months, one of them for almost two years, actually two of them for more than two years. So these um, are quite impressive results for patients with uh, disease so aggressive at sarcoma. Um, so just to have the disease stabilization for such a long period of time, it's significant. For patients with head and neck cancers, with uh, no small cell lung cancer, we have seen very rapid results with shrinkage of the tumor within uh, one and a half, two months after starting treatment. Hi, my name is Jennifer Mosley. I'm a research study coordinator here at the Cancer Therapy and Research Center at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. We ask that the patients practice good hand washing, good hygiene. We ask that they stay away from immunocompromised people, meaning infants, elderly patients, basically just common sense, good hygiene. The number one question we get from patients is usually, is it safe to travel on an airplane or can I travel in general? And the answer to that is yes. Another question we get is, it, is it okay to be around pregnant people during the time that I'm receiving real license? We try to ask that they do stay away from pregnant people for the five days that they are receiving the real license treatment and for two days afterwards. Hi, my name is Anita Garcia and I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist with the University of Texas Health Science Center San Antonio Cancer Therapy and Research Center. Our pharmacy has worked with the real license in combination with chemotherapy in the clinical settings of lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, melanoma, and sarcoma. I did receive a question from one of our nursing staff. Uh, in their standard of practice, they usually flush the line after a drug is given. So the directions for realicin actually instruct the nurses not to flush the line. And we explain that the reason we do that is we want to minimize exposure of, you know, of drug to other people other than the patient. We actually account for the drug that is being given and the drug that will be left in the vial to ensure that the patient gets the full amount of drug. We have a special biohazard container that contains chlorine where we dispose of all contaminated realizing products, such as vials or alcohol swabs. My name is Ernie Magnabosco. I've been treated here at the CTRC. I have osteosarcoma. My first treatment of realizing was March of 08, and the last one was uh, December of 2010. The treatment was uh, well tolerated by me, uh, minimal side effects. That was one of my main concerns on going with a, a trial because uh, I wasn't quite sure on side effects of going with a conventional treatment. The uh, major side effects that I did have was slight chills and fevers. It would actually come about on the second or third day of, of the week of treatment and then uh, they would last probably 20, 25 minutes maximum. And uh, I w it was easily tolerated. It was like a, a feeling of uh, chills and uh, like uncontrolled shakes, like, like you would be uh, shivering. Uh, but like I said, it would pass after about 20 minutes. 
Well, um, I can truly say that the real license has uh, increased my quality of life. I do understand that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a disease that I'm trying to deal with, but the quality of life that I've had on the real license has been very, very good. The agent is extremely well tolerated, so even in the phase one clinical trial of the agent given as, as a single agent therapy intravenously, the only real toxicity was mild fever and some flu-like symptoms, especially in the first cycle of therapy. In my experience, Realicin is no more dangerous than any other chemotherapy product that we compound in our pharmacy. So again, we have to just reassure the patients that they have been exposed to this previously and it's not going to hurt them. It is a safe virus to use. 90% of the adult population or more have been already um, infected with the virus in their life and they develop antibodies so they will not have another infection in their life or develop symptoms um, and as of now after four years we haven't seen any problems again, with family members or personnel. We've now treated more than 350 patients with Realicin. More than 250 of those patients have been treated with intravenous Realicin and its safety profile continues to be very good. Breakthroughs in medical research take far more than the occasional flash of brilliance, as important as that can be. Progress takes time, it takes hard work, it can be unpredictable. It can require a willingness to take risks. You are demonstrating our capacity, not just as a nation, but as human beings to harness our creativity and our ingenuity to save lives, to spare suffering, to build a better world for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren.